Hey everyone, welcome back to Danesthesia, where we pull back the surgical drapes on anesthesia and explore what really happens when we send you off to sleep for surgery, and bring you back safely, of course. I'm Dr. Daniel Medell, an anesthesiologist, and today we're talking about one of the most widely used drugs in my field, and one you've probably heard about, sometimes for the wrong reasons, propofol. It's been called the milk of amnesia because of its white color, and because it can erase your memory faster than a teenager erasing their browser history. You know what I'm talking about. But here's the real question. Why do anesthesiologists reach for it so often? Is it magic? Is it dangerous? Is it tradition? Let's break it down. Propofol is an intravenous anesthetic agent. Chemically, it's a phenol derivative, which sounds like, who cares? But what matters is that it's highly lipid soluble. Because of that, it needs to be dissolved in a lipid emulsion of soybean oil and egg lecithin, which is why it looks like milk. It was first synthesized in the 1970s, and after some reformulations, it became widely available in the late 1980s. Since then, it's completely changed how we practice anesthesia. Unlike inhaled agents like sevoflurane or isoflurane, propofol is given intravenously, and it has a rapid onset and rapid recovery profile. And that makes it incredibly versatile, whether you're using it to induce anesthesia, to maintain sedation in the ICU, or even just to knock someone out briefly for a quick procedure. One thing to remember though is that propofol doesn't just knock you out. It has amnestic, sedative, and even antiemetic properties, meaning it helps prevent nausea, which is pretty important for certain abdominal or neurologic surgeries that have a really high risk of making you feel dizzy and nauseous. Okay, let's get nerdy for a second. How does propofol actually work? The primary mechanism is through GABA-A receptor modulation. Propofol enhances the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA aminobutyric acid, or GABA. When GABA binds to its receptor, it opens chloride channels, causing neurons to become hyperpolarized, basically less likely to fire. Propofol makes that process more effective. So when GABA is around, propofol helps the receptor stay open longer, letting more chloride in and further dampening neuronal activity. That's why patients go unconscious. It's like turning down the volume on the brain. But propofol doesn't just affect consciousness. It also reduces cortical and subcortical brain activity decreases reflexes, it blunts the response to pain at high doses, and it even has some anti-seizure properties. And like I said earlier, it has anti-nausea effects, which is pretty unique for an anesthetic drug. So, in short, propofol boosts inhibition in the brain, rapidly inducing sedation and hypnosis, with some extra perks like anti-nausea and anti-convulsant effects. Now here's where propofol really shines. First, rapid onset. When you inject propofol, it takes effect in about 30 seconds, and that's pretty dang fast, considering using an inhaled anesthetic can take up to five minutes for someone to fall asleep. Second, predictable offset. Even after prolonged infusions, patients usually wake up relatively quickly compared to other drugs. That's because propofol is redistributed rapidly and metabolized efficiently by the liver. Third, smooth recovery. Patients wake up clearer with less grogginess and hangover effect compared to other agents like thiopental or even benzos like midazolam or valium. Fourth, antiemetic properties. Nausea and vomiting are big concerns in anesthesia. Propofol actually reduces the risk, making it the go-to drug for patients prone to PONV. That's post-op nausea and vomiting. And finally, flexibility. You can use it for short sedations, continuous infusions in the ICU, or full-blown induction for general anesthesia. It's no wonder so many anesthesiologists say, if I could only bring one drug to a desert island for anesthesia, it would be propofol. I've literally never heard anyone say that. But as with everything in medicine, there are potential risks and side effects. The biggest issue is cardiovascular depression. Propofol causes your blood vessels to expand, called vasodilation, and it decreases the force and velocity of heart contractions, called myocardial contractility. That means propofol almost always causes blood pressure to drop, sometimes by a lot. In healthy patients, this usually isn't a big deal, but in elderly patients, trauma patients, or those with heart disease, it can sometimes be dangerous. Another issue is respiratory depression. Propofol can slow or even stop someone's breathing if given too fast or in high doses. This is why you almost never see it being used outside of controlled, monitored settings and by trained professionals. And then there's the pain on injection. About 30 to 50% of patients feel a burning sensation when propofol enters the vein. Sometimes it can be excruciating, feeling like a swarm of fire ants is stinging your arm from the inside. That's why we often try to prevent this by giving a little bit of lidocaine beforehand. Lidocaine is a local anesthetic that numbs the area like when you go to the dentist and they numb your gums before drilling. Long infusions also carry the rare but very real risk of propofol infusion syndrome. 
This is actually a life-threatening condition involving metabolic acidosis, cardiac failure, and rhabdomyolysis, which is where muscle tissue breaks down, releasing toxic substances into the bloodstream. It's mostly associated with high doses and prolonged ICU sedation. So yes, propofol is amazing, but it has to be used with care and always with monitoring. Outside the operating room, propofol has a bit of an infamous reputation, mostly because of high profile cases where it was misused. For example, the death of Michael Jackson brought propofol into the spotlight. He was reportedly using it as a sleep aid, which is both inappropriate and dangerous outside of a monitored medical setting. Stories like that sometimes overshadow its legitimate use. But for us in anesthesia, it's a reminder that propofol is powerful stuff, and it'll F you up if you don't respect it. But when used properly, it's one of the safest and most effective anesthetic agents we have. So after all that, why do we use propofol? Well, because it gives us fast, smooth, and predictable anesthesia. Because patients wake up feeling better than with many alternatives. Because it reduces nausea and vomiting and because it's versatile enough to handle everything from a quick endoscopy to a 12-hour tumor excision. Yes, it has risks. Yes, it needs careful monitoring, but in the hands of a trained anesthesia provider, propofol is one of the most reliable tools we have. At the end of the day, anesthesia is all about balance between consciousness and unconsciousness, between safety and effectiveness, and propofol sits right at the center of that balance. So that's the story of propofol, what it is, how it works, why we love it, and what we have to watch out for. If you enjoyed this breakdown and want to see more deep dives into the drugs we use every day in anesthesia, make sure to like, subscribe, and drop a comment with what drug you want to see next. And remember, while propofol might look like milk, it's not the kind of milk you should be drinking at home. Leave it to the OR. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.